Statistical Concepts and Market Returns. This is a long reading with 10 sections. Essentially, we are going to focus on statistical methods which allow us to summarize return distributions. As investors, we are often concerned about returns on our investments and the distribution of those returns. And when evaluating return distributions, we are often looking for central tendency, which means the following. Let's say that the stock market has returned on average 14% over the last 10 years. Obviously, we are concerned with that average number. We are also concerned with dispersion, which tells us how spread out the data has been. One of the simplest measures of dispersion that we'll talk about is range. So for example, if over the last 10 years, the stock market return has ranged between minus 20% and plus 35%, that is also important for us to know. Skewness talks about whether the data is skewed to the right, skewed to the left, or whether it is normal, which means that there is no skewness on either side. And then kurtosis is a slightly more difficult concept that we will talk about towards the end of this reading. All right, let's go over some fundamental concepts. First, the nature of statistics. And it is important to understand that statistics has two broad meanings. When we say, let's collect the statistics on XYZ, we are basically talking about data. So one meaning of statistics is essentially data. Another meaning is related to the methods that we use to collect and analyze data. And this is what we will focus on. When we talk about statistical methods, there are two subcategories. Descriptive statistics essentially describe the properties of a large data set. The mean or average return of 700 stocks in a given stock market, for example, would be a descriptive statistic. This reading is going to focus on descriptive statistics. Inferential statistics use a sample from a population to make a probabilistic statement about the characteristics of a population. In other words, if we have a population that is too large to analyze and we pull a sample out of this population and use the data in the sample to make an inference about the population, then those techniques are referred to as inferential statistics. And this material will be covered in a later reading. Let's cover some basic definitions that will be used in this reading as well as in subsequent readings. A population refers to all members of a specific group. So for example, if you define a population as follows, all the publicly traded stocks in a given country, for example, could be a population. So let's say that that number for a given country is 2000. A parameter describes the characteristics of a population and generally this is denoted by the Greek symbol mu. So the average return of these 2000 stocks might be 10%. So we will say that the parameter mu which describes the average return of the population of stocks is 10%. A sample is a subset which is drawn from this population. Let's say we draw a sample with a size of 30, generally denoted by N. A sample statistic describes the characteristic of a sample, and this generally is denoted by X bar. X bar would be the average return of the 30 stocks in the sample, and X bar is called a sample statistic. Let us now talk about four different measurement scales. A nominal scale is one where we essentially only use names. 
a nominal scale is one where only names make sense so for example if we talk about different kinds of mutual funds you might have a money market mutual fund you might have a stock fund which focuses on growth stocks you might have a stock fund or equity fund that focuses on value stocks so notice that these three different funds are not better or worse relative to each other and essentially only the names make sense because the names are telling us what sort of a fund we are considering in a ordinal scale the order makes sense and a simple example would be the following if we look at all the stock based or equity based mutual funds in a given economy then you might say that here is the first quartile so these are the funds that performed the best then second quartile third quartile and fourth quartile so when we categorize and say that a given category is better than a second category which in turn is better than a third category then this is a ordinal scale in a ordinal scale the order makes sense but we cannot say that this fund or this group of funds is better than this group of funds by x amount and the interval between this and this is not necessarily x the point being that while the order makes sense there is no concept of a equal interval between the different categories with the interval scale however not only do we have a order but the interval also makes sense the classic example of a interval scale would be temperature if you have a temperature of 1 degree centigrade versus 2 degree centigrade and 3 degree centigrade we know that 3 is hotter than 2 2 is hotter than 1 and the difference or the interval between the two makes sense so if this is a 1 degree difference the difference between 2 and 1 is also a 1 degree difference so the interval makes sense however ratio doesn't make sense here we can't say that 2 degree centigrade is twice as hot as 1 degree centigrade and finally the most precise measure is the ratio scale where we have order intervals make sense and the ratio also makes sense the classic example would be the earnings per share of a given company let's say that earnings per share are dollars 2 in the first quarter and then in the second quarter the earnings per share are dollars 4 we can say that in the second quarter the earnings were two times more than the earnings in the first quarter with with a ratio scale there will also be an absolute zero so eps of 0 actually makes sense this means the absence of any earnings and then you can also have negative earnings so in a ratio scale there will be a absolute zero notice that with interval scales there generally won't be a absolute zero in the sense that while we do have a 0 degree centigrade 0 degree centigrade does not mean the absence of temperature Let us work through this practice question. We need to state the scale of measurement for each of the following. The credit rating for a corporate bond. As you will study later, corporate bonds have a credit rating which is an indication of their probability of defaulting and so on. The best credit rating would be AAA which is better than a AA rating. and then lower ratings would be triple b and so on now notice that the order makes sense because triple a rating is better than triple is better than double a rating which would be better than a a rating but we can't say much about the interval so this would be a ordinal scale where the order makes sense next coupon rate 
Bonds often pay a certain amount of coupon expressed as a rate. If a given bond pays a 8% coupon versus another bond that pays 6% coupon, you might also have zero coupon bonds. So notice that this is a ratio scale because we have an absolute zero. And if there is a bond which pays 4%, then we can say that this bond is paying a coupon that is twice that of this bond. Mutual fund classification types. If you have a fund that's classified as a growth fund versus another that's classified as a value fund, this is a nominal scale where only the name makes sense. We can't say that this is better than that or that a value fund is better than a growth fund, but the classification or categorization here essentially is just identifying two different kinds of funds. Name makes sense. This then is a nominal scale. And the easy way to remember this is N for nominal and N for name. And finally, bond maturity. You might have a bond that matures in five years, another bond that matures in 10 years. We can say that the bond that matures in 10 years is, has a maturity that is two times that of this bond. You can also have a bond that would be maturing very, very soon. So the maturity there would be practically zero. And therefore, this would also be a ratio scale. Summarizing data using frequency distribution. Let's say we have the summary data for 100 stocks with prices ranging between 46 and 65, and we want to organize and categorize this data. So what we do is divide the stock price into four intervals of five each, and then we figure out how many stocks fall within each interval and we notice that 25 stocks fall in the 46 to 50 interval 35 in the 51 to 55 interval and so on so this number is called the absolute frequency in other words 25 stocks show up in this interval 35 in this interval and so on cumulative frequency refers to the total number of stocks that have a price of 50 or less. So that's 25 over here. The total number of stocks with a price of 55 or less would be 25 plus 35, which is 60. The total number of stocks or the cumulative number of stocks with a price of 60 or less would be 25 plus 35 plus 29, which is 89. And then the total number of stocks with a price of 65 or less would be 100. That is called cumulative and cumulative because we are essentially accumulating the number of stocks in each interval. Relative frequency simply says how many stocks we have in each interval relative to the total number of stocks. Given that we have 100 stocks, and 25 are in the first interval the relative frequency is 25 over 100 which is 0.25 and these numbers should make sense cumulative relative frequency is simply taking the cumulative frequency and dividing by 100 so here the cumulative frequency is 89 divided by 100 is 0.89 now that you have understood what we've done here, the formal process for constructing a frequency distribution should be fairly obvious. Essentially, we first define the intervals, which is what we did over here. Then we tally the observations and count the observations in each interval. Here is a sort of question that you might get on the exam. Let's see if you can solve it. The correct answer is A, and you can read the explanation. Here is another question. Let's see if you can do this. The correct answer is C, 
and again just go through the explanation moving now to the graphical presentation of data one of the most common ways of presenting data is in the form of a histogram which is simply a bar chart of data that has been grouped into a frequency distribution in other words a histogram is a graphical representation of the frequency distribution that we just saw what you are looking at over here is a histogram of S&P 500 monthly total returns between 1926 and 2002 in case you don't know the S&P 500 is a major index in the United States so what is this histogram telling us it is essentially telling us if we see these different return intervals return interval of 2% to 4% is given over here then we have this as 4 to 6% 6 to 8% and so on so returns have been broken into different intervals of 2% and then we are looking at the number of months where the return fell in a given interval so what this is saying is that in approximately 180 months between 1926 and 2009 the return was between 2% and 4% and then if you look at this number over here let's say this is about 150 in about 150 months the return was between 4% and 6% notice that the histogram gives us a very quick sense of where most of the data lies and that is the big advantage of presenting data graphically in that you can quickly see how the data is distributed a frequency polygon simply takes the midpoints of the histogram and connects those points so if you take this histogram and the midpoints for each one of these bars and connect those midpoints you have what is called a frequency polygon the x axis will have the midpoint of each of the intervals so the 2% to 4% which was shown right here instead of giving the whole range we will just specify the midpoint which is 3% and the frequency will be shown as a midpoint so notice the 3% is shown right here and the midpoint is 180 Let's now look at the cumulative absolute frequency. We've already studied what cumulative absolute frequency means. This is simply the graphical depiction. And to help you interpret what you are looking at here, I will present a question. Let's say that we look at this 4% number over here and I tell you that 4% over here reads off at 650 so how do we interpret this the way we can interpret this is in 650 months the return the monthly return was 4% or less if with zero we read off 400 what that would mean is in 400 months the return was 0% or less than that and then what this would mean is that in approximately let's say this reads off at 890 in 890 months the return was 24% or less the cumulative frequency distribution will level off eventually at the total number of months so if we take a extreme case of 100% then obviously the number of months in which the return was 100% or less will be equal to the total number of months in our measurement period and then after that whether we pick 150% the number of months with returns of 150% or less will simply stay the same let's look at a few practice questions Here the correct answer is C.
Here the correct answer is A. This is a little more difficult. Pause the video and make sure you do this before you move on. Here is the solution. What we have done here is shown the long way of solving the problem where you come up with the relative frequency for each interval and then the question is what is the cumulative relative frequency for this interval and what we then need to do is take all these numbers and add them up which is done right here so the cumulative relative frequency is 83.33 percent a faster way of doing this would be to recognize that we just have one interval left after this and if in that final interval we have 16.67 percent of the data then before 16.67 percent we must have 100 minus this so the quick way of doing it would be to identify 16.67 percent do 100 minus that which would give us 83.33 percent so the way we can express this in plain English is saying that 83.33% of the data is less than 12.